In this lecture, we'll cover an introduction to the endocrine system through hormone regulation. First, let's compare the nervous system with the endocrine system. Your nervous system uses neurons to directly target cells via neurotransmitter release, while your endocrine system instead uses hormones to target cells indirectly because these hormones travel through the bloodstream and they'll eventually they'll reach their target organ and target cells. Your nervous system is a very fast acting response, but that response is short lived. While your endocrine system has a slower response time, but that response is much longer lasting. Although this lecture revolves around the endocrine system and the endocrine glands. We also have exocrine glands, so let's quickly compare. Endocrine glands do not use ducts. We just mentioned that the hormones are secreted into the bloodstream where they make their way through the body. We do have two different categories of endocrine glands or endocrine organs, primary and secondary. Primary endocrine organs only have endocrine function for example, your pituitary, your thyroid, your thymus. While secondary organs have both endocrine and non-endocrine function, for example, your pancreas has both endocrine and digestive functions, while your kidneys have both endocrine and filtration functions, excretion functions, etc. Now, exocrine glands are a bit different. They do use ducts. They're going to use those ducts to move substances or excrete substances directly onto the skin. You are familiar with these. These are your sweat glands, your oil glands, tear glands, and your mammary glands. Now, hormones. We keep saying that word. What are we talking about? Hormones are chemical messengers, and their job is to regulate the function of other cells. We've already mentioned that they travel through the bloodstream. But this allows them to have very extensive effects all over the body. Although we said that the endocrine system was a slow acting system overall, some hormones can take effect within seconds, while others can take hours before their effects are noticed. We did also mention that the endocrine system is a much longer lasting response system, so once those effects of that hormone can uh, begin, the effects will continue until the hormone itself is either broken down or deactivated. Now, we've mentioned repeatedly that the hormones are in the blood. The hormones are in the blood. Well, how do the hormones know which cells are the target cells? The answer is receptors. It's all about the receptors. Each hormone has a specific three-dimensional shape, and the receptor has a complementary three-dimensional shape. So cells have multiple receptors on the plasma membrane and within the cell itself. So they are actually able to respond to the effects of multiple hormones. As you can see in our image, hormone A, hormone B, hormone C all have very different shapes. And our target cell has multiple receptors. And you can see that the shape of the receptor is complementary to the shape of the hormone. Now, we have two main categories of hormones. We have amino acid hormones, and we have steroid hormones. It may or may not shock you to learn that amino acid hormones are composed of amino acids. These hormones are mostly hydrophilic, also known as water-soluble hormones. These bind to receptors on the surface of the plasma membrane itself. Steroid hormones, on the other hand, are created using cholesterol. These are hydrophobic or lipid soluble hormones. The receptors here are located inside of the cell in the cytosol or on the nucleus. So steroid hormones actually pass directly through the plasma membrane to the interior of the cell before they bind to the receptors. Now we have two categories of hormones. We also have two ways in which hormones are activated. Second messenger system is used by the hydrophilic hormones, or the water-soluble hormones. Direct gene activation is used by the hydrophobic, or the lipid-soluble hormones. So the second messenger system. 
We mentioned the hydrophilic hormones are going to use this process, those amino acid hormones. These are the hormones that cannot pass directly through the plasma membrane. Because they cannot pass directly through the plasma membrane, we need that quote unquote second messenger to continue the message inside of the cell where we see physiological changes. So our first messenger is the hormone itself. Our hormone binds to the receptor on the plasma membrane, and this causes changes within the cell. That change is an increased production of a molecule called CAMP, C-A-M-P. Okay. CAMP becomes our second messenger. So in our picture, you can see our water-soluble hormone binding to our receptor on the membrane, and we create CAMP. Now camp, we said it is now our second messenger, so we're going to continue the message. And that message is going to be the activation or deactivation of specific enzymes known as protein kinases. Okay. These protein kinases are what cause the physiological changes inside of the cell. So in our example, our protein kinase is ultimately activating a specific protein. Now, direct gene activation is much simpler. The hydrophilic or the steroid hormones that use this system can pass directly through the plasma membrane. Our receptors are now located in the cell itself, either in the cytosol or on the nucleus. Once that hormone binds to the receptor, that whole complex makes its way into the nucleus and finds a particular piece of DNA and we start the process of protein synthesis. Hopefully you remember transcription and translation. So we're literally creating new proteins. Now, regardless of whether or not you are an amino acid hormone or a steroid hormone, regardless of whether you use second messenger or a direct gene activation, the effects of hormones, we have a lot of options here. Some hormones stimulate glands to release other hormones, or they will stimulate exocrine glands to release secretions. We can activate or inhibit enzymes. We can activate or inhibit mitosis and meiosis, aka cell division. We can activate or inhibit gene expression, also known as protein synthesis. We can even open or close ion channels, which affects membrane potential, which could increase or decrease the likelihood of creating an action potential. And you remember, hopefully, that we use action potentials to transmit nerve impulses and initiate muscle contraction. So we have lots of potential effects of hormones. Because we have so many hormones, we release them at various times. They interact with each other, and they do this in one of three ways. We have permissiveness, synergism, and antagonism. If two hormones act in a permissive manner, one hormone allows the other hormone to do its job. This first hormone must be present in order for the second hormone to work correctly. So for example, thyroid hormone must be present for sex hormones to work properly. Now if two hormones work synergistically, they work together towards the same effect. So for example, glucagon and adrenaline also known as epinephrine, both increase blood sugar levels. They have different target cells and they work in different ways, but both end up increasing blood sugar levels. Lastly, if two hormones are antagonistic towards each other, they have opposite effects. So insulin will help decrease blood glucose, while glucagon will increase blood glucose levels. We can also talk about the regulation of hormones. We have three options here as well. Hormonal, humoral, and neural stimuli. Hormonal stimuli involves an endocrine cell either increasing or decreasing hormone secretion because of another hormone. So for example, thyroid releasing hormone from your hypothalamus. If we increase the production of TRH, we stimulate your anterior pituitary gland. This will increase the production of thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. 
TSH will then activate your thyroid gland to increase production of thyroid hormone. So one gland and one hormone activate another and activate another. Now humoral stimuli, these endocrine cells will either increase or decrease the secretion based on the concentration of ions or molecules in the blood or your extracellular fluids. So insulin and glucagon, for example, work with your blood sugar levels. Okay. If your blood sugar gets too high, insulin comes in and helps lower it. If your blood sugar levels get too low, glucagon helps in raising it. It's all about the blood glucose concentrations. Lastly, your neural stimuli. These endocrine cells respond directly to signals coming from your nervous system. So your big old brain sends information down your spinal cord, out your spinal cord to directly activate your adrenal gland to secrete epinephrine, for example. Yeah, we have mentioned feedback loops previously. We have two options, negative or positive feedback. These also apply to hormone regulation. Negative feedback is the most common feedback loop for hormone regulation. During negative feedback, we are trying to cancel the stimulus. For example, calcitonin works to lower blood calcium levels if they've gotten too high. Parathyroid hormone works to raise blood calcium levels if they've gotten too low. So again, we're trying to do the opposite of what's currently going on. Positive feedback, on the other hand, the effector is trying to enhance the stimulus. So for example, oxytocin works during labor and delivery. The pituitary gland will secrete oxytocin, which in turn stimulates uterine contraction. We're going to enhance this cycle. We're going to do it over and over and over, release more oxytocin, do more uterine contractions until labor, labor and delivery are finished. This concludes our introduction to the endocrine system through hormone 